thank you all for coming and for your interest. Uh, we're going to talk primarily about tools that we use to understand the early solar system and, and the solar system today. But, but keep in mind, we're actually answering questions using these tools. But the tools themselves and the imaging that we do is so different than what people did in the past uh, that it really is, is something in itself that's really interesting. What we wanted to start with was, was this image, which is from um, Robert Hooke in 1665. And this is not a photomicrograph. This is a, a drawing, because, of course, in 1665, when the first microscopy began, there was no, no such thing as a camera. So this is a flea, and it's well, well drawn. But we've come a long way since then, and this happens to be a uh, meteorite. Uh, clasts and objects in meteorites shown in different combinations of red, green, blue channels. And each channel is tuned to a single element. And we'll show you how we use those images in our, in our research. But this was actually a summer student put together a thing like this, a Warhol-like thing. He was very artistic. And I thought, wow, that's cool. We also have imagery in, this, in, this, in, in space, uh, outer space stuff, uh, far away things outside our solar system. Uh, Amanda's an astronomer, so maybe she wants to talk about this image. So what we have here, this image from Hubble, is showing us protoplanetary right disks in the Orion Nebula. So this larger blob is actually a s forming solar system. You can see all the dust. It's edge on, so we're looking at the disk itself. In the top corner, that is a face on disk and you, it's black, you can't see through it because of all the dust. So if we take a look at a visualization, what you're seeing here is a computation of what the Orion Nebula would look like. The three bright stars in the center, that's what we're known as the trapezium. This is located in what would be Orion's sword in the constellation. And what we see is these larger stars blowing off the gases from the smaller stars as they are evolving through time. And these smaller stars, they're losing their gas and it's causing it to condense into clouds and form many solar systems. So what we see now is a disk that has formed, the jets that are coming off of this newly formed solar system, Maybe there are some planets in that reddish area towards the center where there's a lot of dust. So this is a, this is a visualization of real data, but what we do to understand this light that's coming from far away telling us about where solar systems are forming is to make astrophysical models where we were trying to see how, how do the jets form and our astrophysics colleagues are deeply involved in the dynamics. And so you get a small disk and stuff, but you get this massive infall of dust and gas. So what we're trying to do in, in our work is to understand how we get from this to four and a half billion years later, a solar system like ours, or like the ones we see more and more of elsewhere, these exoplanets are in solar systems too. And they're not in the solar system though, that's ours. And, but we have uh, uh, leftovers from that early time where uh, these, these, these disks and solar systems form in very short time, a few million years, five million years. But we have leftovers in the form of comets from in the Kuiper belt and uh, uh, trans-Neptunian uh, objects. Some come from the Oort cloud farther out. And then we have meteorites which come primarily from the asteroid belt. Some come from Mars and, 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 and the Moon, and those are interesting too, but mainly they come from planetary bodies that didn't, didn't actually differentiate and form planets. And so these are called chondrites, and so these are the evidence. And so we basically use these chondrites and the different objects or components inside of them to tell us different things about the chemistry and the dynamics of the early solar system. So this is a, just a picture of a section of one of these chondrites, and in it you can see a couple of the different types of components that we study, including refractory, calcium and aluminum rich inclusions. This happens to be a big melted one, melted droplet that's condensed to, and crystallized to make very white minerals, calcium aluminum rich. Mm -hmm. And these CAIs, as we call them, contain some of the minerals that formed at the highest temperatures in the forming solar system. We also have chondrules, uh, which are rich in iron and magnesium silicates. And these were at one time either partially or completely molten. And these are all held together in an aggregation um, by matrix, which is the material that's basically between all of these chondrules and CAIs. 
And so we have all these different components that are, are in different sizes. How do we actually look at them and study their abundance, the, their chemistry, and their relative proportion to one another? Denton is well, going to take that. When I started here in 2001, I said, wow, I have this collection of stuff like this. But we always study them in two dimensions. We look at the surfaces. This is, happens to be a, a slab that's about a few, a few centimeters in, di in diameter. But we're looking at surfaces. What about the three-dimensional structures? And so I had come from the University of Chicago, where I had not actually used a synchrotron uh, light source. And the synchrotron is a place where you can do three-dimensional CAT scanning. CT is computed tomography. And so what is a synchrotron? A synchrotron, in this case, is a, a ring of electrons flying around at about the speed of light. When they bend, when you bend that beam of electrons, you get x-rays called synchrotron radiation. And those x-rays come off at a tangent to the, uh, to the beam line. When you go into the ring, you see these, these coming off, and see there's the, those bright red x-rays coming off. Those are very dangerous. Uh, these are lead doors, uh, which have safety interlocks. You can't see the x-rays, really. They're just, they just, <laughs> uh, they're just there for show. Um, and you come in, and, you, and you, you, you take a little rock on the end of a stick, and you put it in the most advanced instruments on the planet. And the x-ray beam comes through various devices that condition it, measure its flux, and you go hit the sample and then a scintillator which sends the signal to a camera uh, which is off axis so you don't want that, all those x-rays hitting it. And this is an optics table. That's very nice. You must compete for time in this machine uh, which is, is free to use but you have to go out and, and, and get yourself there. You have to do all the work. And you might get one or two days per year of beam time. And, but the results were fantastic. So back in, the, in, the, in those times, I took my rock on a stick. This is, happens to be a desert meteorite, so it's kind of rusted, but you can still learn a lot from it. And this is a tomography. So this is going right through, a, through the sample like it's a book, just going page by page. And you're looking at each surface. So it's a three-dimensional volume you're, 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 you're going right through. And the bright things are metal, and the darker parts <coughs> are magnesium and silicon oxide minerals. And of course, uh, those are much less dense than iron. And so they attenuate the x-rays to a lesser degree. One of the things I'll return to is at the bottom, there's this very large object here, um, which has these concentric metal-rich um, layers. And I've cut out one frame of many, many frames. And this is a layer of metal grains surrounded by another layer of metal, but silicate in between. And this struck me as something very interesting to study, and we'll return to that, because what we have, to have now in the museum is a CT scanner that we uh, got in 2010. This was, uh, we competed in a round of equipment grants from the NSF, the National Science Foundation, and we won this machine because we had a very strong justification for doing so. This was part of the Recovery Act uh, that was passed in that time. And this is a machine, actually, that's used uh, often in industrial testing. So you'll see here, these knobs and buttons are big enough you can use a, you can use a big leather glove to actually operate the machine, be, if you're looking at the insides of spark plugs or something like that. It's a standard piece of equipment. But we use it, of course, to look at everything imaginable. You might have seen some of the side cafes where people are showing CAT scans of fossils, of the brain cases of birds and dinosaurs, comparing them, things like that. And this is a, this is a phenomenal instrument at the AMH. The way it works is a little different from the synchrotron, which has a flat beam of, of, of coherent x-rays. Here we're using a cone of x-rays generated with an x-ray tube. We rotate the sample the same as we do at the synchrotron, 360 degrees through many, many angles, take many, many pictures. And the computational part is where the image, uh, images that you see are matched to a volume rendering which is the best fit to the attenuation of x-rays in each of those frames. So each volume element, a picture element is a pixel, a volume element is a voxel. So each voxel is given a, 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 a grayscale depending on how, how, how dense it is to x-rays. So what we've done there is used software to take this same chondral here and then just look at the metal part and these metal layers, and we see these concentric rings, which we've colored in different, 
different ways. Morgan Hill, who's a technician up in the MIF, really helped a lot with this. We now, with this instrument, we were able to get a little bit better data right here in the museum with a, essentially a benchtop machine, which we can access as, at will, except for when, when the fossil people are using it, which is all the time. <laughs> but, but we see this, and we're trying to understand how did this rock form as a free-floating object in space? And that's a question that we can address using this kind of information. We can measure the volume, we can measure how much metal is in each area, we can cut it and then measure the chemistry of the different layers. So this is the kind of imaging that leads to discovery. And when we cut things and look at their surfaces, we then use other instruments, which Ellen is going to describe. So we've basically just seen how we understand what rocks or what meteorites look like in three dimensions, but how do we get actual chemical data? And in the Earth and Planetary Science Department, the major workhorse is the electron microprobe. And this instrument, we use electrons to figure out what sorts of elements and the abundance of those elements are in our samples. And so the way this works is that there are electrons that are produced in a filament at the top here that are then uh, funneled down to our sample, which is in a sample chamber at the bottom. And this electron beam interacts with the atoms in the sample. And it, it basically causes one of the inner electrons to be ejected and one of the outer electrons to fall in, emitting an X-ray. And this X-ray, uh, the wavelength of this X-ray, differs depending on what element you're dealing with in, for that particular atom. So then we gather those X-rays and we filter them through a crystal, which basically isolates an element of interest, and this electron microprobe can look at five different elements at a time, because it has five little arms, um, each one doing one element at a time, and then we basically count. The greater the count, the higher the concentration that particular element is at that particular point. So we can do point analyses and really understand a very tiny, you know, micron-sized spot in a mineral sample, but we can also look at this in a slightly broader sense and create entire maps of areas in chondrites or other rock samples. And so what I'm showing here are three different element maps, uh, magnesium on the top, calcium in the middle, and aluminum on the bottom. And wherever you see brighter white, uh, that's where that particular element is in a higher concentration. So for example, Denton's pointing to a very intensely magnesium-rich region on the top, and that's where a particularly large uh, chondrule is located. Now, by themselves, these single element maps aren't super useful for differentiating the different types of components inside of the chondrites, so we like to create the red, green, blue composite maps in order to better differentiate and see sort of the relationships between the different components in these meteorites. And so this is an example of a red, green, blue, magnesium, calcium, aluminum combination. And here you can very clearly distinguish the chondrules, which are very red and magnesium rich, from the calcium and aluminum rich inclusions, which are the, the blue and green. So you can take this a step further. So this is kind of telling you the relative position and abundance of each class of uh, component in meteorites. But then you can look at the individual components. So for instance, I study in particular the calcium and aluminum rich inclusions, of which I'm showing several examples here. And you can break these down and study the individual minerals within them, get their abundance and their composition just from these uh, red, green, blue maps. And so by using this color combination ternary, you can visually determine what mineral you're dealing with. So for example, spinel, which is a magnesium aluminum oxide, would show up as a purple, and you can see that purple color in all three of these CAIs. But just looking at it doesn't really give us any sort of quantitative, hardcore data about these minerals, their abundance, and their exact composition. So in order to do that, we can analyze the individual element maps and using other software and create false color maps, such as these, uh, which have randomly assigned colors for the different mineral species, and go through on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis and identify the different mineral phases. So you didn't put the formulas for these minerals on this chart. Hibonite is calcium hexaluminate, C-A-A-L-12-019, and I think that's all you really want. Yeah, it's, it gets complicated, <laughs> so we'll just... We'll we can just do that afterwards. <laughs> but but the, thing that, the thing that's really critical about this is that Ellen's able to... Um, 
quantify how much of each of these minerals is in each object. And when you start looking at hundreds of objects, you start to understand the forest of objects that formed in the early solar system. And so that gives you statistical power to mm -hmm. correlate things against each other, to try to constrain how did these things form? How, these are the precursors to the planets. How did, how did they form? How did, how did they form? And then by extension, why are the planets different in composition and things like that? Yeah, so this is a relatively new way to look at the composition of things, basically sort of an X-ray vision of the composition, if you will. They didn't have this when I was I in I was just going to say, Denton, how did you do this when you were back in grad school? Well, I did it this <laughs> way. I did it with a microscope, and we did work this is the microscope. Of course, has been around for well, Robert Hooke, 1665. But the the modern petrographic microscope is an is, is a is a workhorse for the last 150 years, and still is a very important tool. This is one in our labs. We have a camera, which is a 10 megapixel camera, very nice object. Um, we have here reflected light source and transmitted light source, transmitted polarized light, and a polarizing source above that we can actually look at things in cross-polarized uh, light. And this is one of those chondrules where here the mineral grains, each one is, is, is changing the light a little bit because it's crystalline material and it's, it's anisotropic to light. And in between those, though, you have black, which is the glass, which is isotropic. In cross-polars, it's black. And then the matrix, the fine-grained minerals between these chondrules and so forth, is dark because it's so fine-grained it scatters light and, 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 and nothing comes through the, the microscope. But we have taken optical microscopy here in the museum in a totally different direction with extraterrestrial materials, and that's what Amanda's doing in her work. So here we have the laser scanning confocal microscope. It was bought in 2010, it is put in a clean room, so all of our samples stay nice and clean now. It has six different laser lines, so we can see mostly reflected light, sometimes fluorescent light that are coming off of our samples. And it has a 34 channel detector, which in each channel we can see a different spectrum of light. So the confocal, is a really cool instrument, mostly because of what we call a confocal pinhole. And this is a piece inside the confocal that blocks out all unfocused light. So by changing our focus on our sample, we can effectively move through it layer by layer. So what you're looking at now is the same sample 30 times. And each image from left to right, top to bottom, is the sample two microns, about two microns deeper. And you can see the same features as you move through the sample. Um, just, just so people know what a micron is, a, a human hair is between 30 and 140 microns in diameter. Yes. So, so very, very we're small. At small, small. Very, very small. Um, and this particular object that we're looking at here is a piece of cometary material from the Stardust mission, which was a Discovery class mission that was launched in 1999 by NASA, and it returned to Earth in 2006 with a capsule filled with material. So on the back of the space probe, there's this cone-like piece that's opened up, and inside that is a collector tray, the tennis racket-looking object, which flipped up, and as the probe flew through the tail of the comet, material impacted the collector, which is made of aerogel, a fascinating material, 99% air, lightest known substance, very good insulator so it can catch these things without destroying them. So we were able to bring back this collector, which is about 30 centimeters wide, filled with cometary material. There's 144 tiles here. Each tile is a separate, separate thing. Yeah, each tile is about two centimeters wide, four centimeters thick. And this was a really, really phenomenal event. These are the first extraterrestrial samples since the Apollo missions 30 years ago at the time of Stardust's return. And this is a phenomenal achievement. They were so excited they threw a dance party right, oh, in, right, behind us. <laughs> right in the clean room when they opened this up. Because this has never been done before and it there are other missions trying, but this has still not been done since. Um, so we're not going to study a two-centimeter-sized tile. 
what they do at JSC is they locate these tracks and they cut them into what we call keystones, which is this triangle of aerogel you see behind me. Inside you see the edge of the aerogel where the cometary material entered, an entrance hole, a bulb-like area where maybe there was an explosion of gas as it hit the collector, and solid material that followed through and created the tail of our impact track. So this is a very small object. You notice the scale bar. The, the track is about what? This track is about a millimeter in size. The largest ones are a couple of centimeters. The smallest ones, you can barely see the keystone with your naked eye. So these are very, very small samples that we're dealing with. Another thing that's really difficult with these is that the aerogel is so low density, it's a silica foam really, and it has extremely high surface area to volume. So any static charge, and these things will just fly wherever they, they fly, and they're impossible they're to find. So <laughs> this is really weird stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's just weird stuff. If you put water on it, it, the water has, the surface tension of the water is so strong that it'll collapse the, 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 the structure into, it'll collapse it all down into a hard little knot. But at the same time, aerogel is incredibly strong and can hold up to 10 times its own weight. But water is its weakness. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't insulate your home with it, but it's used for all of the Mars rovers as the insulating material because it's extremely light. So these samples are very s small, but lucky for us, the confocal has terrific resolution. Here we're looking at, instead of a 3D object, we're looking at a 2D projection. So I've taken all of those different layers and squashed them down so we can see all the different features of our track at once. So what you'll that. maybe also notice is this says 6% scale. So this is the raw data taken down and scaled down to 6% of its size to give you an idea of how much resolution we really have, this is that same image scaled down to 25% of the original resolution. So with the confocal, we can get a good idea of what the morphology of these tracks look like, where different grains are, how big they are, what kind of shapes do they take. But to get more uh, chemical data, we go back to the synchrotron. Yep, we like chemistry. So. As a cosmochemist, I'm, I'm interested in, we're interested in, what is the chemistry? How, you have all these grains in this track, and it hasn't been, and nothing's been done to the track, nothing's been harvested yet. But what we want to do is understand where, the, where are the grains that might contain anomalous concentrations of titanium or zirconium or something interest, that makes them more interesting. After all, there are lots and lots of particles in this track that comes from the comet. What's really cool is that X-ray sources are used for amazing amounts of different things. People do a lot of protein folding. In real time, you can do tomography of proteins folding. It's just amazing. People do studies of the roots of trees and bushes and seeing how arsenic is taken into their root systems in places that are suffering from arsenic in groundwater. People are studying all kinds of things. A lot of drug companies and, and, and material science people are using synchrotrons. And what we're doing here is this x-ray beam comes in here. There's conditioning equipment. Our sample is on this holder. We build our holders ourselves so we can position things just the way we want them. And this is the detector that detects X-ray fluorescence. So just like uh, atoms give off characteristic X-rays when struck by electrons, here the X-ray beam itself is causing fluorescence. Uh, uh, and at each atom, kind of atom, fluoresces at a different wavelength. And so we can detect a spectrum and see these peaks of fluorescence depending on how much of each element is present in the sample. And we've learned how to do that. And this is showing a result for a particular track. Um, here on the top, you can see the confocal microscope projected image. And the entry hole is here. And you're looking at uh, the way that the aerogel is cut here. And this is the same iron map in x-ray fluorescence. So iron is present in lots and lots of mineral grains at some level. Even trace element amounts will give you some fluorescence. And so you see lots of particles near the entry hole. Uh, in this area, something exploded. And of course, we have our terminal particle here, which looks very much like it might be an actual iron-rich grain, a sulfide, an oxide, or a metal itself. 
So, so that's really cool. So this is really going to the finest possible scale of analyzing things using X-ray fluorescence. But we also like to look at big things that way. And that's what, it, what uh, Ellen is working on. This is the uh, messenger mission uh, to Mercury. And I'm sure you all know that the messenger mission is still going strong, orbiting Mercury in a very elliptical orbit so it can cool off in the shade of Mercury and then whip around. And it has the sunshade, which always has to point towards the sun. That's, that's mission priority number one. But there's a hole in the sunshade that actually can measure the X-ray flux from the sun. In the synchrotron, we know exactly, because we make the X-rays. They're handmade. They're handcrafted X-rays. Just they, make, they could have come from Brooklyn, for Christ. But <laughs> the, they're so handcrafted, we know exactly, exactly what their flux is, what their energy is, and everything. Of course, with solar flares and solar radiation, we don't know any of that stuff, except because we have a detector here that's simultaneously de detecting the X-rays from the sun and what their flux is, so we can calibrate the energy, the uh, fluorescence spectrum that comes off the planet and is detected by the spacecraft. The spacecraft has lots of instruments, but the, the XRS, X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, is really one of the most important ones. So Ellen, you want to say more about that? Sure. Well, just to give you guys an idea of what some of this raw data from Mercury looks like, at least in terms of the XRS data, this is the sort of readout that we get and then have to analyze. And what it's showing you is energy intensity on the y-axis in time, generic time on the x-axis, increasing that way. Uh, and what you can see here is all of these little kind of red spots. So red is higher intensity, um, where the sun was hotter and had more energy. And those are flares, essentially. So the lower intensity flares, we can get only a few different element, elemental information from them, such as magnesium, silica, and aluminum. However, when the sun's being a bit more energetic, uh, we see the mid-level flares. And we can start getting calcium concentrations. And then finally, with some of the highest energy flares, we can get elements as heavy as iron, which is awesome. So once you get all of this you know, individual point data, we then can stitch it together and make these sort of chemical maps of the planet. These are big surface. footprints. Yes, they're huge. This is not a micron. This is more like a thousand, Hun hundreds, hundreds of kilometers. Hundreds of kilometers, yes. And so what this map is showing you is the relative intensity of magnesium over the entire surface of Mercury. So where you see the bluer colors, those are regions where there's relatively low concentrations of magnesium. So for instance, the Chloris Basin in the upper right, which is the largest impact basin on Mercury, has a relatively low concentration of magnesium. However, there's also a very red region on this map, and that's where there's a relatively high concentration of magnesium. So this type of information, in combination with the other data sets that the messenger orbiter is gathering, we can start to piece together sort of the chemical and the process history of Mercury, which is pretty cool. Yeah, don't forget, before messenger arrived at Mercury, we had only imaged from space half the planet at all. And those were flybys by the Mariner spacecraft in the 70s. So we had not been to Mercury in a very, very long time. Um, by the way, the Messenger spacecraft is going to um, have a, a, do some litho braking. So you're familiar with aero braking, where when we land on Mars, you, you go through the atmosphere and you're aero braking. You're slowing down by going through the air. Well, it's going to do litho braking, which means it's going to slow down really fast by hitting the surface, the rocks. Uh, so that's litho breaking, and that'll happen next April. So we'll all have a little ceremony. Uh, but, but, but it's been an amazing mission. Uh, a little bit under the radar of a lot of people out there, but certainly not ours. So we've gone over a lot of the instruments and the techniques that we hear at use here at the museum and all a bunch of the different sample types that we use. Um, we're happy to take questions now and we'll be sticking around for a while. Thank you everyone for coming.